Thank you both uh, to Leah and uh, Charles. It's been, um, yeah, it's a, I'm very, very happy, always very, very happy to uh, speak to people about art, but also especially about the Venice Biennale, which uh, remains one of the, one of the, if not the greatest uh, art show uh, on the planet and as it has been for a number of years. Uh, so what we're going to do is in a moment, I'll share my screen, uh, but then we'll start looking at the, the birth of the Biennale and how it has changed across the course of the 20th century and into the 21st century. So it started off as one thing, uh, but then it has transformed for various reasons we'll look at. Uh, and in turn, it has come to uh, be part of a, a gradual transformation of the city of Venice itself. So it has this very close relationship with Venice. So as a place to start, uh, I'm just putting up on the screen here uh, a uh, sculpture of Sean Scully's The Opulent Ascension, uh, which is one of the one of the starring pieces of the 2019 Venice, uh, Venice Biennale. This one here is, um, I'm sorry, just, um, uh, this one here has been, uh, got kind of a, a huge amount of attention right throughout uh, the six months that it was on display. Partly because uh, it's very, very rare to see Sean Scully working in sculpture uh, rather than in painting, uh, but also because of its uh, attention grabbing nature. Uh, so the work itself is about 40 feet high. Uh, it looks quite solid, it looks quite solid and quite firm, but it's actually made out of huge squares of foam, which are then uh, coated in felt. Uh, what this does in the, the setting of it, this is in San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice, so one of the uh, very, one of, one of uh, Palladio's crowning achievements uh, as an architect. Uh, but it's also one of the most prominent places in Venice. It happens to be one of the most painted buildings uh, in history as well. Uh, but the placement of this sculpture here, right beneath the dome, brings into contrast, brings into kind of, I suppose, a very sharp relief between the calmness, the classicism of Palladio's architecture and this kind of very ultra contemporary feel about something that's bright, that's something that's bold. What you can't see here, though, is that you can actually walk around this structure, you can walk around behind it, uh, and then you enter through a small door, kind of a small door had been carved into the back, and then you go into this very, very small space, uh, a space that is uh, by no means COVID safe. Um, you definitely not, wouldn't be able to do this at the moment. Uh, but when you go inside this sculpture, you look up and see that it's perfectly placed to capture the light that's shining down through this dome. Uh, so it's in that sense, the, the work is site specific. It has been constructed for this place to capture a particular effect. So as you walk into the church, you see this brilliant brightness. Um, and part of what makes it bright is that use of the felt covering of it. Uh, the felt, uh, because it doesn't reflect light somehow makes the color look brighter in this space. But when you walk inside, you see it has this very close relationship with the architecture of the building. As you look up, you notice that uh, there's a square that's framed. It's framing a light of uh, a square of light, uh, uh, which, which uh, is then contained uh, within a circle of light. The appearance of a circle of light. So you have these two kind of these fundamental uh, architectural and urban forms: the square and the circle, kind of, which have a very very long history throughout Western art and architecture. Uh, you have those being framed inside a sculpture. So you have this kind of contemporary very, very contemporary looking work, but uh, work that is also very deeply rooted in the traditions that Scully was working with. Um, so I think also the other thing this does is it kind of, it brings to mind one of the essential things about the Venice Biennale is that while it is a gigantic contemporary art fair, uh, it is actually set in Venice and you do get this constant back and forth This constant back and forth between the the contemporary uh, contemporary art that's on display and that wealth of culture, that history, and that beauty of Venice. Uh, one of the other reasons why I think it's particularly good to visit is that you can step outside of a 14th century palace, having seen a fantastic contemporary art exhibition, and you can kind of wander around the place in a bit of a daze without having to worry about being hit by a car. 
Um, I'm not a driver. I tend to get around on feet and being in a city where you can just wander in and out of buildings and not worry about the traffic is absolutely fantastic. Just, uh, just watch the canals. Um, so what I'll do is now I'll talk a little bit more about where the Venice Biennale has come from, how the Biennale develops, um, and a bit about how you experience it today. So the Venice Biennale is, uh, first of all, it is enormously expensive, uh, yeah, successful. It's also very, very expensive to run, but that's a different story. Uh, it, uh, it is the largest art show in the world by far, uh, but it is also the oldest event of its type. The Venice Biennale was the first Biennale uh, and it continues to be used as a model, especially from the 1950s onwards for the more than 120 biennales and triennales there are around the world today. Uh, they're using this model that was initially developed in Venice in the 1890s. But although it's the oldest and uh, remains extremely prestigious, it's constantly evolving. It hasn't managed to survive for now 130, or coming up on 130 years, uh, without having to constantly change over time. Uh, responding to the changes in uh, kind of the world itself, uh, responding to globalization, responding to changes in how and who is interested in art, what art that people are interested in, in looking at. So it's had to constantly evolve over those 130 years. And the length of time that it's been successful, I think, is a testament to how, uh, hmm, how strong that evolution has been, how well thought through that evolution has been. But the Biennale itself is also, and I think this is a key part of its strength, is that it's decentralised. That although there is a committee uh, that run it, the Biennale committee who we'll talk about in a moment, uh, there is a group of people who run it. They devolve most of the authority to actually put the art on display, to choose what's going to be shown. They devolve that to all sorts of people, whether that's to a, a curator who is appointed to run a big central exhibition whether that's to individual nations who are participating as nations, or whether that's to individual galleries or kind of um, not-for-profit art groups who are also involved in it. And it's this decentralization that I think provides it with uh, its great strength. It can be gigantic, but it never feels samey because so many people are involved. So many people are actively choosing to show this sort of art or that sort of art, art by this person to take this angle on it. Whereas if you had a very large art show that were, had a very strongly centralised uh, approach to it, I think it would risk becoming samey. You would gradually feel that kind of, okay, this curator's vision was good for the first three days. By the fourth day, I want to see somebody else. And that doesn't tend to happen in Venice. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is just to give you a, a rough sense of what the uh, Biennale is like in case you haven't been there. So in the top right-hand corner, we're looking at the Biennale Giardini. Uh, the Giardini is an area, it's kind of a, a parkland on the outskirts of Venice. It's only about a 15 minute walk from St. Mark's, but that counts as the outskirts of Venice. Uh, originally, this area used to be the housing area uh, for the workers in Venice's Arsenale, this great shipyard that made, that made, Venice's, uh, made Venice what it was, made it kind of the most powerful European economy right throughout the Middle Ages, is because of this shipping. Uh, and the area here, uh, which we're looking at in the top right, used to be where the workers for that shipyard used to live until Napoleon came along and decided what people really needed in Venice was uh, big boulevards, avenues lined with trees uh, for a proper kind of uh, bourgeois lifestyle because walking around beside the canals, getting around in a gondola is just not enough. What you need is a tree-lined avenue to be a proper modern city. So Napoleon comes in, kind of flattens the, uh, the workers' accommodation to create this large park. If we skip forward about 120 years into the early 20th century, uh, we find then that this park it becomes used for hosting the Venice Biennale. And beneath this, so this is the central avenue that we're looking at here. Uh, so if you we imagine that on the bottom right, we're walking down, walking down through along this direction here from left to right, uh, looking in, uh, down through this long avenue. Uh, on the right-hand side, you walk past uh, Switzerland, Venezuela, Denmark. These are national pavilions, pavilions that those countries have paid to build, have paid to maintain, and where every two years when the Biennale is on, they show their, the, the art that those countries themselves select uh, to put on display. Um, so kind of, we can see this here is just now one side of the Venice Biennale uh, with all of these different national pavilions, including Australia's over in the corner. 
but this is just one, while this is one of the early sites for the Biennale, uh, it is no longer the, the largest single site. The largest single site now for the Venice Biennale, I'm showing a very, very small amount here on the lower left, is now the, the Arsenale. So that huge shipyard, which is mostly, it has been, well, it was mostly well, since the, the late 19th century fell out, of, fell out of use because you can't get modern ships. You can't build a modern ship in Venice and get it out. The water is too shallow. Uh, so these huge shipyards, these ones here are 17th century. Um, this uh, is a gallery, which is uh, about 700 meters long and 40 meters wide. And this was the, the factory that they used to make the, the rope for all the rigging on these ships. So you have these huge pre-modern industrial spaces that had been disused uh, from the late 19th century right up until the 1980s when the Venice Biennale is given a section of it uh, to transform into a uh, gallery space. Uh, so we're looking at just through one very, very small section of this, but you have to imagine that this is a 700 metre long hall that's 40 metres wide. You then turn a corner and you've got a similarly large building also uh, full to the brim, full of, of contemporary art. Uh, so in the Arsenale alone now, you've got more than 40,000 square metres of display space. So it's a huge, um, a huge centre, uh, as well as all of these buildings, all of these national pavilions inside the, the Giardini. Uh, but the Biennale goes beyond these two sites. It's truly uh, exceptionally large. So on the top left here, so there, uh, this is from 2015, a map that I put together just uh, marking out where different exhibitions were in the city of Venice. And each one of these marks might be a single exhibition. It might be a small, uh, only a few rooms, or it could be in the case of say, this mark over here for the Giardini, it could actually be uh, 40 or 50 different exhibitions. Something like the Palazzo Grassi here, this little, uh, this little marker there, uh, happens to be uh, a three-story exhibition space. So this is a selection of what was available to see in Venice in 2015, and that wasn't the largest Biennale either. So you, as you're walking through the city, you've got to imagine you've got these custom-built spaces, you've got these repurposed spaces, uh, and then you've kind of got uh, exhibitions in Venetian palaces. So you walk into a Gothic palace and suddenly find that you've got uh, something fantastic on display. Uh, so down the bottom here, just to give you a sense of how you get this, uh, this wonderful contrast between the old and the new, is from uh, uh, Luke Toman's exhibition that was in the Palazzo Grassi, uh, three floors of Luke Toman's. It was, a, it was a fantastic, it was a beautiful exhibition. Uh, perfectly, wonderfully curated, very easy to move around. Uh, but you have to stop and look up every now and then and realise that you're looking up to the original uh, 17th century coppered ceiling of the building as well, with all of its gilding wonderfully restored. Uh, so you've got this constant back and forth, this constant uh, contrast between the old and the new, which I think is part of what makes the Biennale manageable to visit. You don't get overwhelmed. You do get tired after a long day of looking at art, uh, but you don't get kind of, um, you don't get museum fatigue the same way that you do as if you're, if you're uh, looking at art in other places. So the Biennale itself is institutionally speaking, uh, a body formed in 1890s to have general oversight over an international Biennale of art. Uh, today, that, that group, uh, that kind of body that has the oversight, uh, now oversees the Biennale for Art, or Biennale for Dance, Biennale for Architecture, Biennale for Theatre, uh, and it also oversees the Venice Film Festival, which is in, incidentally, it's also the oldest film festival that's continually running in the world. Uh, it started up in the 1930s and Cannes doesn't start until after World War II. Um, in, the pair of them actually made an agreement to run on either side of summer so they don't compete with one another. Um, but, for the art, you know, but for the Art Biennale, um, this group, this organisation has oversight for between 120 and 150 exhibitions every two years. Uh, it's responsible for selecting an international curator. Uh, so in this red section here, for example, and this part over here on the left of the Arsenale are given over for a centrally curated exhibition. And once that curator is selected, uh, the committee generally don't get involved. They let the curator be the curator. Uh, on the right here is for also from 2015 is Okwe Onweza, uh, who was kind of, it was um, almost like he's kind of, well, this is, you can, you can do what you want with the Biennale. You're kind of at the very peak of a very long prestigious career. Um, and it's kind of, 
they're, they're selecting people like this who they can give the authority to create what they want and they'll go ahead and organize it. Um, the curator too also often sets a theme for, well, since the late 1970s, the curator has set a theme for what the Biennale is going to be about. But whether each of these nations or other, other galleries want to follow that theme is entirely optional. And quite frequently galleries decide, okay, that's a wonderful theme, but oh, we're gonna go and do something else with our space instead, thank you very much. So it's, again, it's, it's very amorphous, a very uh, kind of changing and shifting uh, kind of uh, event. However, the Biennale has come to mean much more than what it is officially. As you can imagine, if you have people, um, and over the past 20 years, the Venice Biennale generally gets uh, 550 to 600,000 people visiting it each, uh, each year. Um, it's on for six months of the year, so as long as you don't go in the opening week, it's generally not overcrowded. Uh, the opening week is the worst time to be there because then you've got 24,000 people who are there for three days to try and review it. Um, so you have to line up. You don't go in the opening week, you can then kind of get around it very, very easily. But because you have so many people coming to Venice over the course of that six months to look at contemporary art, you can imagine that every other contemporary art or kind of every other person who, who can get to Venice and rent a space in Venice or to have a, occupy a space in Venice will be there. They'll jump on the bandwagon knowing that there's this, there's this captive audience coming to Venice to look at art. So if you throw something up inside a palace, people are going to come inside and have a look. Um, so this means that each year, each, every second year, um, between May and November, um, it's no longer in odd numbered years. They, um, uh, they shifted next year's Venice Biennale to 2022. So now the Biennale will be in even numbered years. But every, every time it's on, you can expect more than 200 art exhibitions. Uh, everything from relatively small exhibitions, from national exhibitions, uh, right through to these institutions that have three or four or five uh, floors of art on display. In the central exhibition, so that one that's organised for that curator, the Biennale Point, um, it can change it, uh, quite radically from year to year as well. So last year, only 79 artists were select, had work selected across these two super venues. Um, but in, say, the previous year, 2017, more than 400 artists were involved in that single central exhibition alone. So it changes a lot from year to year. On top of that, we had 89 national pavilions, so nations that have either have a permanent space or have rented space to be able to have uh, something on display from an artist from who's a part of that nation. We then had 21 collateral exhibitions. So collateral exhibitions are exhibitions that are independently organized that the Venice Biennale gives a tick of approval to. They, get, they allow them to use the sign and the Biennale will advertise that that exhibition is there to see. On top of that, you had 86 privately organized and publicized exhibitions on inside the city of Venice. You had 13 art foundations holding exhibitions as well, and you have 16 major museums, each of which has at least one special exhibition time to coincide with the Venice Biennale. So it's kind of, it's the size of this, and you're trying to think, well, if I go to three exhibitions a day, you'll need to be there for six months to be able to get your way through it. Um, it's so large that no one can actually review the entire Venice Biennale. Um, can you imagine how, how big the book would have to be to review uh, in excess of 200 exhibitions. Um, so just to give you a sense that these exhibitions too don't look the same. So on the top left here is a space inside the central exhibition. This is one of the ones that's curated by the, uh, by the appointed curator. On the right, we've got Fiona Hall from the Australian, uh, uh, the, the opening, the first exhibition to be held inside Australia's new pavilion. And down below are Lorenzo Quinn's hands. Um, which were kind of the most photographed thing in Venice a couple of years ago when these hands were installed. So they're, they're made in Barcelona, shipped to Venice, floated down the Grand Canal on barges and installed. This beautiful pair of hands reaching up out of the water. Uh, the, the work is called support. Uh, so kind of the hands reaching up from the water, trying to stop the world from sinking uh, into, the, into the, the wonderful surrounds of Venice. It does, when you have an art exhibition of this size though, it does kind of make you, I think, naturally question why does Venice even need that? If you've been to Venice or you know much about Venice's history, you know that the city is already brimming with older art uh, from the Middle Ages, from the Renaissance, from the Baroque period, from the neoclassical period. Uh, so kind of why does a, a city like Venice need to have 
such a large contemporary art event. So if you take a quick walk around through just kind of what you can see in a very, a very short walk around Venice, you can go and see a textbook Victor, uh, Carpaccio inside. These are some of the only Carpaccios that are still seen in the place that they were painted for. Around the corner from that, you've got beautiful altarpieces by, uh, by Giovanni Bellini. Near the corner there, and this is kind of one of Venice's great best kept secrets, you have there the Hellenic Institute's collection of icon painting. These are mostly icons that were painted by uh, naturalized Venetians, Venetians whose uh, ancestors had come from Cyprus, mainland Greece, from Crete, uh, from the coast of Turkey. Uh, these are kind of these are Greek Orthodox Venetians who continue this, this uh, tradition of icon painting in Venice. And there's a wonderful museum which shows about 400 years of Venetian icon painting. That's, uh, these are icons painted for the, the Greek Orthodox community of Venice, um, which Venice has had for more than a thousand years. Um, so it's a, these are, these, each of these are with only a few minutes walk from one another. Then you can kind of cross over to the other side. You get kind of Giorgione um, in the Academia. You kind of get kind of uh, Tintoretto wherever you look. Around the corner from there, you kind of walk down to the Frari. You've got more uh, beautiful works by Giovanni Bellini. You've got Titian, of course. Uh, then you've got Tiepolo in other churches. Uh, around the corner from the Frari, kind of quite literally around the corner. If you happen to like Tintoretto, you can go and visit the Scuola Grande di San Rocco. Uh, which was painted by Tintoretto over the course of about 25 years. It's kind of the Sistine Chapel of Tintoretto. All of the canvases in the ceiling, all of the canvases on the walls, uh, in a whole other room off to the side on the ground floor, uh, are all by Tintoretto. And then you've kind of got these the wonderful gilding, the wonderful uh, terrazzo flooring, the wonderful woodworking. It's a city that's already overflowing with art. And then, of course, there are the mosaics in of St. Mark. Um, which are best seen and kind of it's another one of these secrets in Venice that's slowly kind of being uh, let out of the bag. You can actually organise to go in and see these lit up at night as part of a small group without being elbowed by people. And you go in there and you sit down, they turn the lights on and you get some marks to yourself and you can kind of really enjoy the splendour of it. So when Venice already has this huge array of art, why does it need such a large contemporary art event on top of that? And the background to that is a rather unfortunate story of Venice's decline in the 19th century. So right throughout the 19th century, Venice's economy is tanking. Um, there's not much they seem to be able to do about it. They're no longer, they're part of, of, part of France, they're part of Austria, then they're part of a unified kingdom of Italy. They're on the fringe. They're no longer a, kind of a, a major port. They've lost access to their, the control of trade that had sustained the city for 1400 years. Um, and we're finding that kind of it's in this period that these old Venetian families are having to sell off their works, sell off paintings, uh, sell off their Titians, sell off their Veronese, uh, so that they can afford the upkeep of their palaces. So when you go around, say, major galleries in Germany, in the UK, or in the US, and you see works by Veronese, chances are those works, were, or Titian, chances are those works were bought from a Venetian family in the 19th century because the city is no longer wealthy and they're selling these works off to try and prop up, try and prop their own families up, try and maintain their palaces. However, in the 1890s, a group of three Venetian noblemen get together, they're sitting on the Lido. Uh, they've seen kind of uh, the world expositions of the, of the later 19th century. And they come up with this idea of what about having just the equivalent of a world exposition just for contemporary art that you can bring all of the contemporary art to Venice. You can bring all of the best stuff from around Europe. You can throw it up for, uh, for sale in Venice. You can display it on Venice. And then you can get people coming to Venice to see that. Uh, what they were thinking would happen is that Venice would pay for the shipping of the art from other countries in Europe. And they would get a cut of the, the sale price. So they were effectively doing what Venice had been doing for hundreds of years beforehand by um, moving other people's stuff around and taking a cut, kind of um, is what they were th uh, how it was originally conceived. What they didn't expect, however, is that more than 200,000 people would turn up to that first show uh, in the middle, in 1895. And from that point on, somebody kind of gets the idea that kind of actually what makes the Biennale work for Venice uh, is the tourism dollar, that Venice effectively discovers uh, modern art tourism uh, in the 1890s. 
uh, a good 70, 80 years before the term art tourism is, is even coined. So Venice is kind of, they accidentally discover that you can make people travel vast distances to look at contemporary art that isn't even from Venice, simply by bringing it together in one place and showing it well. So for two years later, the Biennale Committee start inviting participants. They say, well, we're gonna start cherry picking these artists, no more applications, we invite people to it. And they start buying works for Italian galleries. Uh, one in particular, which we'll look at in a moment, uh, becomes Italy's first modern art gallery. Uh, so up above is just the, the initial uh, ad, advert for the very first Biennale in 1895. And it's interesting to see that it has the figures of who coughed up the money to pay for it. Uh, so you have the municipio, uh, kind of the town council of Venice, coughed up 10,000 lira. The Ministry of Culture coughed up 5,000. The province of the Veneto coughed up, and coughed up another 5,000. And the Casa Risparmio, uh, the savings bank, threw in 5,000 as well. So with a, an investment of 25,000 lira into creating uh, the first type of first art show of its, of its type, um, they kind of realized actually kind of this pays back in kind of a way that we didn't really expect. Uh, they thought it would be successful, but not that uh, successful. In this sense, there, what uh, Venice is doing is part of a very long historical context um, that Venice had been, but essentially Venice's entire life as a city has been based on uh, Venice has very few natural resources other than salt and fish. Uh, it makes its wealth and continues to make its wealth by moving other people's stuff around. Um, in the case of Venice in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, being at the centre of a trade route that connects the Black Sea to Bruges to Northern Africa. That's the, the western end of the Silk Road. Um, and the sort of they following that idea on, we keep moving other people's stuff around, we take a percentage of that and the city with no natural resources can continue to live. However, we start seeing some changes in the Biennale within the, the, the first few decades of it. Um, so first thing I think it's worth mentioning is that up until the 1930s, when the, the Biennale uh, is theoretically closed, when the fascists take control of the Biennale, the Biennale say those years during the fascists don't count at all. Um, but that period from 1895 up until the 1930s is alarmingly conservative. It's not what we think the Biennale should be about. So we know that right through the 1920s, they're still primarily displaying works of Impressionism and post-Impressionism. In the 1920s, that's all very, very old hat. No one's thinking of that as being avant-garde art. But it's part of a commercial imperative that that art is well-established. That art has a well-established following. That art also, because Venice is taking a cut on the sales, uh, that art also has a very uh, predictable price uh, at sale. Whereas contemporary art can tend to be a bit more kind of up and down. It's a bit more volatile. So these first few decades, the Venice Biennale is actually very, very conservative. And Picasso, for example, isn't shown in the Venice Biennale until after World War II, a good 30 years after he'd been at the avant-garde. Um, anyway, the other key change we start seeing happening in the Venice Biennale in this period is the participation of nations. The different nations around Europe start buying, buying up a space in the Giardini, constructing a building, to make it as a permanent presence. Uh, incidentally, the first nation to do this was Belgium. Uh, we don't think of Belgium as a great imperial power, but in the early 20th century, Belgium had great pretensions of being an imperial power um, and was kind of one of the, uh, the most violent towards people in Africa of all European colonial powers. Anyway, but um, Belgium had set themselves up. They wanted a permanent presence. In subsequent years, they're followed by Great Britain, Hungary, Germany, and Russia. These are imperial nations who, of Europe who are competing with one another. They're using the Biennale as a, a kind of an international competition to showcase their art. It's kind of a cultural diplomacy or soft power. Uh, so we have this kind of nationalistic imperative in the Venice Biennale from the early 20th century. Uh, and that transforms the Biennale into a kind of international art Olympics. Um, by 1932, the Biennale has become so successful that they come up with their first spin-off. Um, we're doing a great job with the visual arts, let's do film now. Uh, in 1932, they create the Venice Film Festival, which is also the very first uh, uh, ongoing international film festival. Then we have the years where it goes downhill during the fascist period, where the fascists take control of it. Um, and we kind of, the Biennale says those years don't count as Biennales. 
Uh, and by 1938, only two countries are involved anyway. Only Italy and Germany turn up in 1938. Uh, nobody else really wants to be there. Um, so as you walk around, you see kind of the remains of this national participation. And as you walk through, especially the Giardini, you're getting kind of a kind of a history of European architecture in the 20th century as well. Um, so just a few examples up here, we've kind of got the uh, the Russian pavilion and the Hungarian pavilion, both of these kind of, uh, kind of uh, incidentally, the Hungarian pavilion was made after World War II as if, uh, but it was making it look as if it was a, uh, an earlier style of building. Um, but you kind of get these examples of these kind of uh, Central European and Eastern European architectural styles, uh, whereas what's now the Danish pavilion was designed by Alvar Alto. He designed this extension uh, and on the right, the, the top right, the, the newest building in Venice um, is the Australian Pavilion by um, Dendekor Marshall, which was um, opened uh, in 2015. Um, there was a debate within Venice. The, the town council met to debate whether or not they should ap approve a building this modern in Venice. And the mayor of Venice, when the decision was made, came out and said that kind of, well, in the Giardini, you have a hundred years of architectural history that each of those buildings when it was built was a good example of then contemporary architecture. So Australia has permission to build this new, the most modern building in Venice uh, because it's adding to this history of architecture that Venice is having built inside it. Um, so kind of it's, kind of, it's quite diverse. So all the buildings look, the same, uh, look different. The art you see inside also tends to look very different. After World War II, however, we start to see some major changes uh, within the Venice Biennale. Um, so first of all, there's a change in focus when they get the Biennale up and running again in 1948. Uh, so it ceases to be a commercial event. Uh, so the art is no longer for sale from the, the late 1940s onwards. Um, it's also perhaps very good for Venice because it turns out in the 1950s and 60s, you start seeing uh, installation art, a kind of art becoming larger and larger and thus more expensive to ship. Uh, so it's also in this period that Venice no longer pays for the shipping. If you want to be involved, you've got to get the stuff to Venice yourself. Um, uh, but they're no longer selling the art as well. And it's then written into the rules that kind of none of the art on display is actually for sale in Venice. Uh, we all know you go somewhere else. You go up to Basel and buy it in Basel. And you buy it when you're in Switzerland, even though you saw it in Venice. Um, but technically, none of this work is for sale. Uh, the prizes that were awarded for the best pavilions, the best artists, the best young artists were also removed in the early 1960s uh, as a kind of this idea that kind of if you're giving an award, um, it's fundamentally uh, unegalitarian. Uh, you're saying one person is better than another, we're all equal, this is meant to be an even playing field. So they scrapped the awards in the middle of the 60s. One of the main shifts though that we see in terms of what the event looks like is we start seeing a focus on avant-garde art. Uh, so you start seeing Picasso, Braque, Dufy, Arp and Pollock being displayed from 1948 onwards. It's quite a, a huge shift from showing impressionist and post-impressionist works up until 1932 to then suddenly kind of go, hang on, we want, we want the avant-garde uh, to be on display here. We also see the Venice Biennale shifting towards, it's, re, it's, re, um, it's angling itself in a different direction. It's starting to focus on being a place of inter, an international exchange of ideas. And this is happening in cinema too. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in visual arts, but in cinema in the 1950s, it's at the Venice Film Festival where Europeans are getting a taste of Japanese cinema, Czech cinema, Russian cinema. Uh, and that's mixing with French, Italian, uh, British and American cinema as well. But it's uh, seen as a, a place where these different ideas can be exchanged, uh, bring everything, the best from around the world together in one place and let those who are interested experience and see it all in one go. But the Biennale too becomes increasingly political, especially after 1968 um, uh, and the kind of the the European-wide uh, revolts, um, student rebellions and whatnot in, in the late 60s, uh, starts seeing kind of the Biennale becoming uh, very, very politicised uh, and increasingly in the 1970s, there's the sense of the Biennale becoming very, very elitist. Um, I think I once referred to it as our black skivvy art, the sort of art that you can only turn up and appreciate if you've read 50 books on it before you've turned up. Uh, so that's something the Venice Biennale will break away from in the 1980s, try and get out of this, uh, this highly elitist understanding of art. Um, 
It's also engaging in, and we can kind of see kind of elements of what's behind this in who's displaying what. So what I'm showing you here is a, ma a map of the different pavilions of the foreign pavilions who were showing in Venice uh, in 1948. Um, so you start looking around at the countries who are involved, Denmark, the United States, Belgium, Holland, Holland Italy, Germany, um, France, Great Britain that these are each uh, countries that are very much part of a Western bloc. Um, as far east as you get, perhaps uh, Poland, uh, you also get Hungary, and you get Czechoslovakia. This is 1948. These countries will very, very soon uh, be kind of behind, kind of be closed off from things like the Venice Biennale within a couple of, within a year after this show in 1948. That's also interesting too, though, that there are some absences in this. So the Tedeschi, the Germans, are thrown up in a back corner behind a whole exhibition of Picasso that was um, incidentally curated by a Renato Gotoso, uh, curator this um, uh, exhibition of Picasso. But the original German pavilion is down here in the corner, where instead of having Germany in that pavilion, uh, they had a grand display of Impressionism that had been put together by the art historian, curated by the art historian uh, Roberto Longhi, who's a fantastic art historian but a deeply conservative one so he's seeing all this contemporary stuff going on and says no we have to go back to the 1920s uh if not the 1880s let's have an impressionist exhibition again the reason why the germans aren't using the german pavilion is that the building that we have uh the german pavilion originally there had been one prior to world war one uh in 1938 that building is destroyed and replaced with this building with by the architect ernst heigler uh, and it's one of the few surviving pieces of Nazi architecture. The German cultural, the West German and then the German kind of Ministry of Culture about every 10 years requests permission to be able to demolish this building. They don't want this permanent reminder um, of this Nazi past. Uh, and every single time the city of Venice has, had, has said no, they've put a heritage order on it saying kind of this building is a part of history. This building is a part of your history. It's part of European history. You can't destroy it and pretend it never happened. Nonetheless, we find that over the years, German artists engage with this building in quite interesting ways, in ways that are often quite controversial. Uh, so this was from uh, 1980 when um, Anselm Kiefer, sorry, I've got the L and the E in his name back to front, uh, when Anselm Kiefer was showing one of his works here. This one here is German Spiritual Heroes. So he's showing this, this empty hall with these eternal flames down the side of it. Uh, it's a period where Kiefer was kind of very... Uh, deliberately working as an, as an anti-fascist artist, trying to make sure that West Germans couldn't deny any involvement in the past. But this work was received as being quite shocking at the time uh, because there's a sense, there's an ambiguity in it. Are these eternal flames for fallen German spiritual heroes? Um, is he commenting on a kind of a, a secret kind of um, unwillingness to kind of extinguish the flames of fascism in Germany? Or is this an empty hall that is to be filled with new national heroes? Uh, so Kiefer was commenting on this quite directly, but the placement of it in this building was also a choice to try and directly engage uh, with the legacy of, of Nazism and the legacy of the Holocaust. So if we skip forward a few years, um, we then start seeing, this is from the, the middle of the 1950s, you start seeing that we've suddenly got a whole range of different countries being involved. Um, start seeing, say, Yugoslavia. Uh, Hungary now has built its own new pavilion. Israel, Israel in 1958 was kind of barely 10 years old. It has its permanent presence uh, next to the US. Czechoslovakia is still one place. They've got their own pavilion. Uh, Switzerland's added. Venezuela has been added. Spain has joined. Japan has joined. So you get this sense of kind of these uh, increasing reach. That's something that's continued right throughout into the 21st century, the kind of the number of different countries that are involved, especially over the past 20 years, has really branched out. And it's not just a European focused exhibition, uh, it's increasingly genuinely international from Pacific Islands, from different countries in Africa through to South America, as well as the kind of the traditional big players of the modern art world. In this period too, we start seeing the Venice Biennale becoming a key driving a kind of a driving force for changes in Western European art. And the prime mover here is Peggy Guggenheim. So in 1948, Peggy allowed her permanent, who'd just recently settled permanently in Venice, uh, allowed her collection to be on display as part of the Venice Biennale uh, inside the Greece Pavilion for um, some uncertain reason. 
So this is one of the finest collections of modern art, private collections of modern art in Europe at the time, uh, and it was being displayed in Venice. In amongst this work, though, she was also uh, displaying Jackson Pollock in Europe for the very first time. And there's this sense that kind of um, uh, people in Europe suddenly realise that America has a culture, uh, that America has its own culture. It develops its own unique art forms. Um, America does something for the world other than kind of uh, bombs, tanks, and the Marshall Plan. They're kind of it's a, and there's this kind of growing interest uh, filtered initially through the Venice Biennale, through uh, through when people get to see Pollock for the first time, but then starts kind of uh, I was kind of seeing this leading to changes in European painting, European sculpture, European art, as uh, Western Europe starts looking towards America uh, as an equal cultural player and not just as a supplier of of protection and money. When Peggy does open up her exhibition to the public, and it's now, she would then every Biennale, every summer would allow people in for a few weeks to go through her house to look at it. Um, it's a truly spectacular collection and kind of she casually, or the Guggenheim ca casually mentions it on the website, that if you come and visit the Guggenheim, you see Clay, Picasso, Braque, Duchamp, Leger, Brancouche, Severini, Ballard, Dali, Magritte, Delaunay, Kouchka, Miro, Picabia, Mondrian, Kandinsky, Van Dersberg, Giacometti, Ernst, Pollock, Rothko, Calder, Moore, and Marini. Um, and each of these artists that they have up there, they, it's generally a good, a good example of their work. Uh, it's a good piece rather than kind of a, some dross that was bought simply to say that they had one. Um, so it's a, it's a truly spectacular collection that people were going uh, and they still go to see. But as an excited side of exchange, it's this kind of idea that people, that they, it's um, you go to the Biennale to get kind of see, to experience the best of what's from around the world and to share ideas. And that's something that's become uh, connected to this particular work, Pollock's Alchemy, which when it was restored uh, a few years ago, had 250,000 people come to Venice and buy a ticket to go and see the restored work of art. It's kind of, there's this sense in amongst the European art community, that kind of, well, this, yes, Venice was the place where we discovered America, uh, that where we have all these new influences coming in. It was a wonderful piece of work to try and restore. Uh, more than 50 specialists were involved in the restoration of this work, uh, mostly because no one had ever had to figure out how you clean up and restore old house paint on a tablecloth, especially when it had been hanging in Peggy, Guggen Peggy Guggenheim's house surrounded by sweat, cigar smoke, splashes of wine from one too many parties. Um, so kind of it was that to actually figure out how you'd restore it. So the restoration process of this is, is itself a fantastic thing to read about. But it's not just, uh, it's not just Pollock, we find that the New York School more generally, uh, so in this case, uh, Norman Lewis's Cathedral was shown in 1956. Uh, it's a kind of this entry point, this point of engagement between this kind of, I suppose, the new Western Bloc, um, as that's consolidating during the Cold War. That continues into the 1960s uh, and the Venice Biennale in 1964 is also where Europeans discover pop art. Uh, Rauschenberg wins first prize in the Biennale uh, in 1964, one of the last people to be awarded a prize before they decided uh, giving people a prize is undemocratic. Um, so in the 1880s and 90s, we skip ahead. So we have this sense of the, uh, the Biennale becoming increasingly elitist across the 1970s. Uh, the general public, it's aren't really involved, aren't really engaged with it as much as uh, the Biennale would like. So in the 80s, they start taking a new direction. They take a new administrative structure. Um, they start trying to make it as a financially sustainable entity for the long term. And they shift to trying to engage an international art going public. Uh, to make it more accessible, to make it more fun, uh, to kind of remove the black skivvies so we can actually have more people coming there to enjoy, to appreciate the art. But while they're doing this, they're not trying to make it overly populist. They try, there's a very careful balancing act um, <coughs> um, where they're still providing exposure for the avant-garde, for the very newest, uh, the most kind of weird and interesting ideas, as well as giving career recognition to people like Jasper Johns in 1990, uh, 1988, uh, for somebody who is capable of being both popular uh, and also kind of intellectually very engaged. In the back of their mind is as well that in the, throughout the 60s and 70s, the number of Biennales around the world is increasing. They're getting some serious competition from places like Sao Paulo, for example, uh, from Documenta um, in Castle. They're getting competition for the, from these other places, so they have to reorient themselves 
to try and keep themselves at the top of the ladder. The other thing that's changed too is in the 1970s, we start seeing the rise of the commercial art fair um, uh, and, and how that's driven forward by Art Basel from 1970 onwards. Um, so they kind of, they have this international competition that Venice is not the only place you can go to see a great exhibition. So they start rethinking about how to get more people here. Um, what do we display? Kind of how do we encourage more people to, to be involved? And this becomes part and parcel of one of the great changes in Venice, where Venice becomes an art city. Um, uh, and not just a city of the old art, but also a city of modern and contemporary art. So this also goes back from the very beginnings, the very early part of the Venice Biennale, um, when the Venice uh, in the Car Pesaro uh, was found, had founded in it the very first metropolitan, uh, so publicly owned modern art gallery in all of Italy. Um, I'm sure you might remember going to Rome up until recently and you would go and visit the, the Gallery of Modern Art in Rome in the Palazzo Barberini only to find that it's works by Raphael and Caravaggio, that that was modern. Um, so this is Venice's very, very first modern art gallery. And the money for this came from the Duchess Felicita Bevelacqua La Maza, who donated her own palace, the Carpezero, to the city of Venice along with quite a substantial endowment for them to be able to develop a modern art collection. Part of that endowment too was uh, effectively scholarships and space in the upper floors, studio space in the upper floors for young Italian artists to keep developing a modern Italian art as well. Inside the Carpezzaro today, it's another one of these kind of great museums in Venice that nobody ever goes to. Um, you've got kind of this art collection that the city of Venice has developed mostly from buying works from the Biennale in the first, during the first 50 years of the Venice Biennale. So it is a, it's a pretty wonderful collection of art uh, that, that is on display in there. Um, but the Bebelacqua La Maza Foundation also continues to support local artists in Venice today, artists from the Veneto, uh, and they have Venice's perhaps most hidden art gallery, uh, hidden in plain sight. They have two floors of gallery space in Piazza San Marco, where every year they're constantly displaying contemporary art by young Italian artists, young artists from the Veneto region in particular, or up into, uh, even up around the border of the Dolomites. They have two floors of gallery space um, next to the busiest place in Venice. And you can go inside and there's, again, only ever a handful of people inside. So if you're looking at St. Mark's, so you're looking at the Basilica and you're standing at the back of the piazza, uh, the entry is on your right-hand side in the very back right-hand corner of the piazza. Um, fabulous place. Um, sometimes the art is great, sometimes less so, uh, but it's still wonderful to be able to walk around. It's also just needing a quiet moment. It's good to drop into. Um, but the, the growth of these public collections in Venice and these public art spaces goes hand in hand with the development of and the displaying of private collections in Venice and the growth of these private art spaces in Venice. So in 1985, Peggy Guggenheim's residence was fully converted into a museum. Originally, this is just this part or, or just the small part, her actual residence that fronts onto the, onto the Grand Canal. Eight years later, they needed to buy buildings next door. And they bought buildings through here so that they could move the administration out of her palace uh, and have the administration kept separately. Six years later, they buy two more neighboring buildings. Uh, they buy the neighbours up because they need to add extra temporary exhibition space. They've got so many people coming, they want to expand, they've got the money, they keep buying out their neighbours. Um, and that's what we see in here today, as well as the Museum Cafe, uh, the addition of the Schulhof Collection, which is about 80 works of post-war European and American artists uh, adding to Peggy's collection. And currently there are plans to kind of buy the buildings on the other side of the street um, to kind of continually expand this. Uh, this is because the, so since the 1980s when it opened, the gallery space in the Guggenheim has more than doubled in Venice. Uh, and its annual attendance has gone from about 100,000 people a year to 500,000 people a year. This is the most, this is the second most visited place in Venice after the, uh, after the Doge's Palace. Um, my advice if you're going there is to try and go at about 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. That's the time in the afternoon that everyone who's not staying in Venice will be going back to go and catch a train to go somewhere else. So if you go in around that time, the place empties out slowly and you can, uh, you can enjoy it a little bit more than you can, say, in the middle of the day. But the Guggenheim is only just one of these fantastic collections. At the same time that it's developing, 
we have Gianni Agnelli who bought the Palazzo Grassi uh, and converted this neoclassical palace into a three, four story art gallery. Uh, so we can show off kind of part of the Agnelli collection as you do. Um, um, a couple of or the following year, the Chini Foundation opened up its galleries. Um, the foundation had been around since the late 1950s, had been a research and convention center, but they have a huge amount of gallery space, um, mostly on the island of San Giorgio Maggiore, uh, several warehouses which are now used for displaying art. Um, but they've started to kind of from 1984, they were thinking kind of, well, while people are coming for the Biennale, let's use this space, convert these old industrial spaces into, into art spaces. Um, in the background, perhaps, in, the, in terms of what uh, Venice gets out of this, is first of all, there are these huge buildings that get repurposed. And if they're repurposed, they get used, they stop decaying, they won't collapse. Uh, but they're also struggling from the 80s onwards with mass, mass tourism and the sheer number of people who are coming to Venice. And part of what more recently uh, could be part of Venice's as a city's interest in the Biennale and for similar events is that it attracts cultural tourism rather than regular tourism. Uh, and cultural tourism or cultural tourists we know are more likely to stay in Venice are more likely to go out of their way to find an actual Venetian restaurant. They're not generally coming in on a cruise ship uh, eating a slice of pizza from a, uh, a shop front that's owned by somebody 25,000 miles away. Um, it's a different sort of economic relationships. They're trying to use, they're backing the Biennale to try and encourage a more sustainable form of tourism in the city of Venice. Um, but they're discovering this in the, 19, in the 1980s uh, as a way of trying to address um, the environmental and social effects of mass tourism on the city of Venice. Um, but to give you a sense of the size of the Palazzo Grassi, it's even got its own kind of own Vaporetto stop on the side. This is the view from the Grand Canal. Um, it was recently bought, so 15 years ago, it was bought by, uh, off the Agnelli by Francois Pinot, who uses it <clears throat> to stage blockbuster exhibitions. Uh, and while these exhibitions are not technically part of the Venice Biennale, they happen to coincide with the Venice Biennale. So he's kind of jumping on the bandwagon. Every two years, I'm going to have my main exhibition, um, the big blockbuster one, when I know 600,000 people are coming to Venice to look at contemporary art. So this is from a couple of years ago. This is from a Damien Hirst exhibition where you have this whopping great big kind of a statue installed in the, in the courtyard, had to kind of, had to take off the roof and kind of I'd lower it piece by piece in by crane and then reassemble it inside. Um, it was quite a controversial exhibition uh, and some people didn't realize the, the humor that was behind it um, and thought it was serious, but that's a whole other, a whole other story. Um, but if you're a man like Francois Pinot, who has one of the largest private art collections in Europe, um, he's a kind of a, an art superpower in his own right. Um, he mostly buys stuff because he likes it or his advisors say, you need to build your collection by buying these people. But he still kind of says, I like that. Um, uh, kind of, I own half the world's cosmetics so I can afford it. Um, anyway, he's, um, so it's a huge, uh, now the Pinot Foundation is huge. They've got one space in Venice. They've already got this building to use, but what do you do if you're the man who has everything? You see this building come up for tender in 2006. Uh, he wins the tender to turn the 17th century customs house at the very entry to the Grand Canal uh, to convert it into another contemporary art space. Um, to make that conversion, he, kind of, uh, he commissions Tadao Ando to come in to work with the space, to take an old customs house and turn it into a contemporary art space. And it's done beautifully. Um, Ando's minimalism, uh, his use of concrete, his use of very industrial materials goes perfectly with kind of the bare original walls, uh, the restored wooden ceilings. It's a very uh, harmonious um, conversion of the space into an art gallery. Um, it too also has fantastic views outside the window um, and in summer it's great because it's air conditioned and you can sit and look out and watch people go up and down the Grand Canal while looking at contemporary art. But these are some of the some of the players and there's an increasing number of these different groups involved in Venice uh, who keep turning up in Venice to keep buying up palaces simply to, to display art. So in 2011, Mucha Prada uh, joined the bandwagon. So you, kind of, you have the Prada setting up in Milan. They buy this palace here, uh, the Car Corner della Regina. They pay to renovate the palace and they use it for, to exhibit. Initially, they were just exhibiting works from the Prada Foundation. Um, 
And now more recently over the past say two years, they've started to kind of organize massive monographic exhibitions and so not just their own work, a monographic general exhibitions uh, inside again, three floors of, uh, of um, Renaissance Palace to, uh, to enjoy. When you look at it, they also, part of the restoration also included restoring the 17th century frescoes, restoring the paintings on the ceilings. So you get this wonderful contrast. In this case, this is from, um, uh, from last year, uh, kind of where you've kind of got Arte Povera, you've got a, a retrospective of Janus Cornelis being shown in, the, in these kind of wonderful Renaissance spaces, but side by side with the 17th century artworks. It's um, on the walls. It's kind of, it's, it's wonderful. If you don't happen to like the artist, you can at least kind of think, oh, well, kind of, um, I could just take a step back 400 years and look at what's on the wall instead. But behind this, and this is where I think I will, I will come up towards an end, is that the context more recently in Venice has started to change too, over, particularly over the past 15 years. Uh, and the change, the pace of change at the Biennale has been accelerating uh, over the past decade. So for its first 100 years, the Venice Biennale was mostly focused on national participation, uh, getting nation states to cough up, to compete with one another, to create a kind of an international art Olympics. But many people's experience of the world is transnational. The people might be a member of multiple nations. They might be a member of a diaspora. They might be, a, um, in this case, they might be stateless and anonymous. Um, and the Venice Biennale is trying to shift away a little bit, away from those, um, uh, that kind of national focus. It will continue to have a national focus. Those national pavilions are still a core part of it. Uh, but they're also starting to look at other different kind of uh, other different experiences, other groups of people. And this is a way to try and increase the sort of national participation, to increase an, to increase an international participation in Venice. Sometimes this goes awry. In the case of Iceland in 2015, uh, they took a deconsecrated church and for their exhibition, they created a mosque in it that went very, very, uh, very it was very popular while it was open for about a week before um, uh, the, Venice's, uh, the Veneto's right-wing government decided they would shut it down on an OH&S breach uh, because you can't have a mosque in Venice, although Venice has been engaging, engaging with the Islamic world for 1,300 years. Um, anyway, um, so sometimes you do get these things that are slightly controversial, which are trying to uh, form bridges between different peoples and traditions. An example that was less controversial for most people, though, was the amenity exhibition um, uh, which won the, the Golden Lion in 2015, uh, where it was an exhibition that was looking at um, after, kind of um, after genocide, uh, reflecting on the Armenian genocide from, uh, in, from 1915, a century later. Uh, and you had these works that were kind of often very deeply moving, very, very powerful, but always had this message of hope, a growth. Um, so it was a genuinely beautiful exhibition uh, that was held in the Armenian Cultural Center, which is on a small island um, in Venice, uh, which was awarded the, the Golden Lion. Um, you have the Pavilion of the Diaspora, which uh, is increasingly involved in Venice. Um, and these are people from different diasporas. In this case here, these are artists who are working from um, a um, people of uh, kind of an African diaspora based in the UK. Um, you also have somebody like uh, Edmund Duval, whose Library of Exile was created inside. This one here was a thousand books, uh, all written by authors in exile, brought together in this idea of creating a library where anyone in Venice can walk into this building, take off a book, leave a message, read somebody or somebody who is writing in a, uh, from a permanent state of exile. The choice of the building, the choice of the location in this case is perfect too. This used to be the equivalent of Venice's Academy of the Arts and Letters. Uh, so it's been, the building is almost always closed off to the public. It has no real function anymore. But he had the idea of transforming it into a library, bringing the voices of people from all far-flung corners of the universe together into one place so that if you come to Venice, you can pick something off the shelf and you can travel the world. Uh, you can get all of these different experiences of different authors across time and place. But while this happens, and while you do have these, there, were, there is a kind of a, a political direction going on in this, you still have the Venice Biennale on the other hand, as a place where you can see kind of, um, and be on the cutting edge of artists who are about to make it in a really big way. 
So this is from the, uh, a pair of artists, a pair of young Russian artists called, uh, who work together called our Recycle Group. And this is from their exhibition that they had managed to organise independently um, to run inside the church of St. Anthony in a small, largely abandoned church, little visited, the doors are never open, um, near the Arsenale in Venice. And each of these works here, kind of they're working with neoclassicism, they're working with Renaissance traditions, Renaissance aesthetics. But instead of these being religious scenes, this is a religion of the modern age that's being shown here. These are the apostles creating telecommunication towers, creating the internet, installing the NBN, are receiving inspiration through screens as these faces come out to talk to them. So it's a very, they're, they're, as a pair of artists, they're fantastically clever. But what makes this doubly clever is that while they're talking about webs, um, internets, all that sort of stuff, these works are actually made out of wire, out of, uh, sorry, white plastic mesh. So the material they're using is actually a web. Um, so kind of, again, kind of self-reflecting on the material itself reflects what they're talking about in this kind of translation from one period to another. They were, were kind of, they were kind of uh, up and comers. They were kind of a pair of young artists, I think, well, one of them today is only, I think, 35. So this is what, he would have been 30 and exhibiting at the Venice Biennale. Um, a couple of years later, they come back and now they're, they've made it in that four year period from having an international audience seeing them for the first time. Uh, they then become the, uh, one of the group of artists who are working to represent Russia in the Russian pavilion. And they kind of, they, their work has changed substantially from this stuff to what they're doing here, where they're starting to work with um, uh, digitally augmented reality. Uh, so these aren't digital sculptures, they're not just physical sculptures, these are sculptures that you can only engage using your actual eyes and through the mediation of a device with a Wi-Fi connection. So these are people who have been frozen in ice. Uh, they're taken from Dante's Divine Comedy, people who are frozen down the very bottom of hell, close to Satan for whatever their sins were. Uh, but if you kind of look at it through a phone screen or you look at it through, you just walk around with an iPad, pick it up and have a look, suddenly the sculptures emerge. So you have this kind of digital augmentation of reality. Each one of these people who have been frozen here, frozen in the very, very depths of hell, have committed some sort of cardinal sin against the internet. Um, their content is blocked because they've been spamming. Their identity is false. Uh, they're abusing people online. These are crimes against the internet. And these people are locked permanently in the ice, but you can only see them when you're looking through a device. So while you have all of these different artists coming together, when you do go to Venice, you can see stuff that is extremely new. Uh, and if you go repeatedly, if you go a couple of times over the years, you can actually watch the development of artists who break onto the scene in their early 30s, creating things like this to become national participants a couple of years later, representing their country, uh, to suddenly being very well represented by galleries around the world as kind of one of the most successful emerging contemporary artists who are, their work is fantastic, but their work is also very clever. Um, but I shall end here. So I've gone a little bit over, but I'm happy to hang around for questions if you have them.